On behalf of the Spurlock Museum, welcome to this afternoon's talk. I would like to begin today by recognizing and acknowledging that the museum and university are on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Piankashaw, Wea, Miami, Muscoutin, Odawa, Sauk, Meskwaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw nations. These lands were the traditional territory of these native nations prior to their forced removal. These lands continue to carry the stories of these nations and their struggles for survival and identity. As a land grant institution, the University of Illinois has a particular responsibility to acknowledge the peoples of these lands, as well as the histories of dispossession that have allowed for the growth of this institution for the past 150 years. We are also obligated to reflect on and actively address these histories and the role that this university has played in shaping them. This acknowledgement and the centering of Native peoples is a start as we move forward for the next 150 years. My name is Beth Watkins and I am the coordinator of the museum's current exhibit, Debates, Decisions, Demands, Objects of Campaigns and Activism, for which our speaker today, Dr. Nathan Tai, is curator. Dr. Tai completed his PhD at Illinois in 2019 and is now an assistant professor of history at the University of Nebraska Kearney. He specializes in the histories of Nebraska, the American West and Midwest, labor, gender, and sexuality, as well as digital and public history. His research documents the fascinating but misunderstood lives of hobos, tramps, and other transient workers who traveled across the West and Midwest by hopping trains from the 1870s through the 1930s. Today is the second of three talks that Dr. Tai is giving in conjunction with our exhibit. Today's topic builds on work Nathan did during his time at Illinois, including his research, teaching, and talks on the university's sesquicentennial and history in 2017. We invite you to use the Zoom Q&A function for any questions or comments during the talk, and we'll be sure to have time for them at the end. Auto-generated captions are available when you turn on the closed captioning live transcript button at the bottom of your Zoom window. This talk is being recorded and will be uploaded to the museum's Facebook page and YouTube channel later this month. And now I welcome Nathan for our presidents and candidates on campus, a short history. Well, welcome everyone. Thank you for uh, coming to my talk today. Um, it's gonna be kind of an interesting uh, conversation and, and hopefully, you know, I, I look forward to kind of our Q&A as, as I'm sure some of you will remember maybe some of the more recent visits by these different political figures. Maybe you were there in 92 when, when Hillary was campaigning or 94 when she was the commencement speaker, um, 98 when, when Gore and, and, and Bill Clinton came to the university or, or even more recently. Or maybe, um, you know, you were there when JFK was, was there in 1960 and can share what that experience was like. Um, and these, this is kind of an interesting way to look at the history of the university um, because it's a reflection both of the place of the university within national politics, um, the changing dynamics of, of campaign styles and, and American politics. Um, it's a reflection of Illinois politics as well. Um, that these figures are, are coming to a space that represents a wide swath of the state, not just, you know, students from Chicago, but students from all over um, are, are attending the university and are able to, you know, share the, what they're learning at these events and, and kind of bring it back to their communities. Um, but it also reflects the university's position, both on the global stage, as we're going to see particularly during the Cold War, um, and its position nationally, that there's a reason why these figures are coming to this institution specifically. Um, and, and this is actually going to be articulated most clearly, um, as, as we'll see in a number of the kind of speeches. Um, in our conversation today, even though it says presidents and candidates on campus, um, I take a very capacious definition of what campus means. Um, so we're going to also look at other candidates who are who are visiting the wider Champaign um, County area, um, you know, because the, the, the kind of division between town and gown isn't necessarily there when when a candidate is in town, that the students, when, when Theodore Roosevelt comes to Champaign and speaks at Westside Park, you know, there are university students there, even though Roosevelt doesn't actually step foot on campus. And Abraham Lincoln, who spends quite a significant amount of time in Champaign County and signs the, the Morrill Act, which brings the University of Illinois into existence through the land-grant college system, um, 
is is no longer living by the time the university is founded in 1867, but nevertheless spends a significant amount of time in the area and, in, and even on places that eventually do become become the university. Um, and there are other figures, you know, um, we're going to talk a lot about uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, who, who is is not a candidate and is never um, the president, but nevertheless visits campus frequently and as both first lady and then, um, you know, a United Nations official is is a dynamic kind of political force, both nationally and internationally and, and her kind of visits to campus reflect her changing role, um, both nationally and on the world stage. Um, and there's others who are also visiting. We have failed candidates. We have former vice presidents. We have ex presidents. Um, and others who are, um, you know, visiting the area and, and visiting campus and, and shaping kind of, you know, the political um, dynamics of the area. And, and today we're, you know, I'm going to focus on some of the more historic, the older stories. Um, and some of these lesser known visits again, as I mentioned, you know, some of you may have been there um, in 98 for for the visit by the Vice President and the President or or more recently when uh, Bernie Sanders or then Vice President Joe Biden was on campus or in 2018 for the most recent visit by former President Barack Obama when he spoke at Bollinger Auditorium. Um, and so it's my hope that that in kind of our Q&A, if you have those experiences, you can share them. But I'm emphasizing kind of the earlier stuff, the things that, um, you know, people might not remember or might not even know about. Um, but I hope we can have a good discussion, um, you know, in the question and answer session. Um, and so I want to begin with, you know, where every kind of story about politics in Illinois seems to to begin um, is with Abraham Lincoln. And so Abraham Lincoln is a um, as I as I denote here, he's a frequent visitor to the Champaign County area. Um, he has close family ties to the area. Uh, Coles County, uh, which is immediately south of Champaign County, is where his father and stepmother um, ultimately spend the last years of their lives, um, where the family farm is at, and where both um, Thomas and Sarah Bush Lincoln are buried. And and um, Abraham Lincoln, it's he visits his his stepmother before he becomes president. Um, he visits his father's grave, um, Thomas Lincoln, in um, uh, Coles County, and so he has he has deep ties to this kind of central Illinois area beyond even his his you know time in Springfield or or time in in Salem, um, and he's visiting Champaign frequently, um, Champaign County, when he's when he's an attorney on um, writing the circuit for the district court. Um, and so we see actually here this both, this is a, a newspaper clipping from the um, Central Illinois Gazette um, describing um, Abraham Lincoln um, in 1859, actually when he's in the area doing campaigning for the presidency. Um, in the local paper, you know, we do not pretend to know whether Mr. Lincoln will ever be uh, con uh, condescended to occupy the White House or not, but if he should, it is in comfort to know that he has established him for himself a character and reputation of sufficient strength and parity to with, um, withstand the disreputable and corrupting influences of even that locality. That, in short, Abraham Lincoln's a good person, we know him, and he would be good enough to assume the office of the presidency. But this is this is 1859, 1860. He's, he's already had an established reputation in the community. Um, as a young attorney, he is actually the defense attorney in the first murder trial in Champaign County in 1845. Um, this murder trial, he, he is appointed by the court to be the defense attorney, um, but the individual who is, is is on trial escapes um, before the trial is actually able to 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 go forward um, and flees to Wisconsin and lives to a ripe old age. Um, so it's not the first successful murder trial in the county, but um, shows again his legal involvement in the um, community. And he also is he's kind of rising to a political figure. Um, he's also coming to the area in 1856 during the first Republican presidential campaign. Um, by then, John, the candidate John C. Fremont, Abraham Lincoln is stump speeching in Champaign. Um, he gives a speech at, at the Goose Pond Church at, at the approximate location of where uh, the Champaign Police Department is today. There is a historical marker denoting this. Um, he gives a speech in support of John C. Fremont. Um, in 1857, the following year then, as you see here, he actually has a photograph taken in Urbana. Um, this photograph was taken by a, by a German immigrant photographer um, who operated a studio on the second floor of a building in downtown Urbana. Um, it is now the parking lot of the Busey Bank. There is also a historical marker there where they have a reproduction of this photo. 
Um, and the way that the, the the kind of story of this photograph is, is that Abraham Lincoln only had his um, duster that he would ride when, when uh, would wear when he was riding the circuit, riding his horse. And so he borrowed the photographer's um, velvet jacket, which didn't quite fit. And so if you kind of look at it a little closely, um, you know, Abraham Lincoln is a large gentleman um, and, and the photographer was a much smaller man. And so the jacket doesn't quite, it's pinching a little bit at the shoulders um, in this photograph. But, but again, Abraham Lincoln, um, is involved in the community. He's known to the community. Um, he's a local political figure, and there are remnants kind of of his legal career um, in the historical archives of the community. There are court cases and other documents, um, you know, relating to his time. And he fi he makes a final visit during his campaign for the presidency. He does come um, in 1860 um, and leads a campaign um, rally, and is is but ultimately um, does not return after when he leaves to Washington for the presidency, he does not return um, to to the state. Um, um, and, and so never, never again is, is visiting um, Champaign County, but but does spend a significant amount of time. So he's the first kind of notable um, president who is who is coming to the area. And as the individual who ultimately signs the Morrill Act and brings about the land grant system, even though he never visits the university proper, um, because it's founded after his death, he, he is the, the founding figure for what becomes the University of Illinois. Um, and the next kind of presidential figure who, who visits the community, um, and this is also, again, my capacious definition of what is a president and what is um, a visit even, is Woodrow Wilson. So um, Dr. Woodrow Wilson, the political scientist at, the, at, at Princeton University, um, doesn't actually visit campus in 1892. What happens is he is offered the job of the regent of the University of Illinois. Um, there is an open position um, and the trustees, this is kind of an interesting footnote in the, the wider um, administrative history of the university. And, and for those who are really interested in the history of Illinois, knowing who becomes the, the president in 1892 of the university instead of Woodrow Wilson is kind of an interesting what if, um, uh, what had happened. But in 1892, he, he is approached by the board of trustees um, with an offer of, of a salary of six thousand dollars which is quite a princely sum um, in this time period if he would be willing to move to urbana and assume the presidency of the university and in his correspondence with his wife ellen um, which i have i have i have um, put a selected quote here from this is actually after his, the first offer is he's teaching in a class and two of the trustees show up at his classroom and so this is almost certainly a violation of contemporary, um, you know, HR hiring practices that you just don't show up a thousand miles away at the door of the candidate asking whether they um, want the job. Um, but as you can see, you know, I was not embarrassed simply because I did not care what impression I make. He is not particularly impressed with the job at the beginning. He doesn't really know that much about the university. Um, he's Southern born, but spends a lot of his time um, in New England. He's an Ivy League trained professor. He is is not really interested in kind of the educational opportunities of what he considers the West. Um, and in particular, um, in, a, in a later letter to his wife says that I am, quote, I am not at all in sympathy with co-education, end quote, um, because Princeton at this time is still an entirely men's institution, whereas the Il University of Illinois um, is educating both men and women and is and in his correspondence with which there is quite a bit of correspondence over the two week period that he considers the, the job offer um, that the idea of a Western co educational college is is not where he sees his future. Um, he has significant concerns um, about the budget. He, he does some conversations. He has some conversations with with figures in Chicago, like Cyrus McCormick of, of the McCormick Reaper Company, among others, um, about the future of the institution, the size of the institution, um, which in 1892 is, is, is not very large. Um, there are only about six buildings on campus. The student body is is quite small and the budget is very unclear. Um, the, the legislative debates about appropriations for the university are still um, very um, fraught. And he's also kind of concerned about what that would mean for him. He would much rather be in a position where there is a stable set of funding and he's not having to go hat in hand to the capital all the time, you know, asking for, for appropriations every single um, session. Although he does admit that he has some interest that the the um, nascent politician in him would, would actually kind of like to get involved in some of these fights. Um, and he understood that the position 
you know, would take away from some of the things that he wanted to do. He wa he had uh, plans for kind of a liter some some literary pursuits and further research, and and had, had discussed and met with other university presidents, um, particularly um, uh, President Canfield of the University of Nebraska, the the father of of the author Dorothy Canfield, actually, um, and understood that he was going to have to give up his research agenda. And that was something that he was he was he was unwilling to do. Um, and he also understood that the position, the University of Illinois at this time period was going to require someone who who was young, like himself, a young academic with progressive ideas and a willingness to kind of really push the envelope to make the university what it could be. Um, and that it was going to require someone with a committed vision of at least 10 to 15 years um, and, and giving up the best years of an academic career to really devote oneself to the institution and, and understood that this would take the best years of his, his academic career. So ultimately, he declines um, after two weeks of correspondence with his wife, who was who was in Columbia, South Carolina at the time, um, and telegrams with with friends in um, the Chicago area and others, um, and ultimately decides and, and declines the job because of, um, he ultimately argues that he is not the person, he is not the one who is going to be committed to really bringing about this vision. Um, and so the university ultimately will, will find a different figure uh, in Edmund James, who will lead the university um, in what would have been Woodrow Wilson's um, tenure as the president of the University of Illinois. Um, and, and as you as those who who are who are kind of more familiar with with Wilson's career, um, it, then in a number of years, um, 1906, he is going to become the president of Princeton, um, and after that, he's going to become the governor of New Jersey, and in 1912, um, the president of the United States. But ultimately, never visits the University of Illinois, never visits to Urbana, um, but does does consider strongly the prospect in 1892. Um, and the next kind of presidential figure to make a visit is, is actually someone who has spent an, an, a significant amount of time in the area, even more so than Brian, or sorry, than, than Lincoln. And that's this gentleman who is Adelaide Stevenson, or Adelaide Stevenson the first. So this is the grandfather of um, the, the more well-known governor of Illinois, um, United Nations um, ambassador and, and two-time presidential candidate um, against uh, Dwight D. Eisenhower in the 1950s. Um, and, and he spends, from his teenage years forward, um, time in Bloomington, Illinois, just, just north of Champaign, um, where he is a practicing attorney and a Democrat and, and is practicing on the same legal circuit as Abraham Lincoln and also knows uh, Stephen A. Douglas quite well. Um, so has, you know, kind of this, a similar trajectory as, as both of those men, um, but has a much longer uh, political career um, than both of them. Um, he will become the um, vice president during Grover Cleveland's second administration, right? If those that random presidential factoid, Grover Cleveland, is the only um, non-consecutive presidential candidate or uh, presidential administration. Um, and he would also be William Jennings Bryan's vice presidential nominee in 1900, um, having actually run against um, William Jennings Bryan for the Democratic nomination in 1896. So he former former opponent turned um, vice presidential candidate. And so when he arrives in the University of Illinois, and he's 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 come to Champaign quite a bit, both as an attorney um, and just living up the road in Bloomington, where where um, he he remains. He is he is buried next to his grandson in the cemetery. Um, that he uh, is coming in is uh, noted in this um, selection from the local paper for his run for governor in 1908, where he does lose, but but does actually make quite a good showing. Um, for the office of governor of the state of Illinois. Um, and so it's, it's, it's quite incredible, again, showing the length of his career, that it's someone who practiced um, law as a, as, a, as a contemporary of Abraham Lincoln in the 1850s and 1860s is running for governor of Illinois as the Democratic Party candidate in 1908. Um, and part of the reason why he's also coming is that same election, 1908, his former running mate, William Jennings Bryan, another Illinois-born politician, um, is running for president for the third and final time um, and, and ultimately does not win. And so um, is th this this large image, the, the poster for the um, um, rally is also accompanied by this text where he is he is also there and, and is being hosted by the Bryan Club, by the supporters of William Jennings Bryan on campus. And so what you see here is a beginning of presidential candidates to come to the area and actually campaign. 
um, actively. And in this case, it is for the governor, but you're seeing figures um, who have either sought the presidency, um, served in some capacity, but the, the shifting notion of kind of campaigning, um, the, the ability of railroad travel um, has, has, has made it easier for candidates to actually get out and about quickly and have more meetings. Um, and so you're going to see an increase then now in the early 20th century with the number of politicians who are able to visit um, the Champaign area um, and visit campus specifically to, to, to do these kinds of visits. And that then comes with the arrival of William Howard Taft in 1911. Um, so this is the first visit by an acting president to the University of Illinois. And it is specifically a visit to the University of Illinois in 1911. Um, and he's arriving actually at an interesting time in his administration. Um, he had been the vice president for Theodore Roosevelt um, and was kind of Theodore Roosevelt's handpicked successor. Um, but there has been there's rumblings in this time period that Theodore Roosevelt wants to run again and ultimately does in 1912 against William Howard Taft and Woodrow Wilson, um, ultimately getting second place um, to um, um, Woodrow Wilson, who, who becomes president. Um, but when William Howard Taft is arriving, he's arriving in the middle of an international um, debate over a, uh, the United States and Canada reciprocity treaty, um, that the United States and Canada are in this process of reestablishing um, kind of diplomatic and trade relations and kind of sussing out what their relationship specifically is. There had been an earlier reciprocity treaty signed in the 19th century, um, but there had been there were uh, renewed efforts to kind of have a a much uh, more modernized kind of, of trade relationship and and causes a significant amount of debate actually causes the collapse of the Canadian government in 1911 um, and the removal of the prime minister um, because of the failure of the treaty to to ultimately um, be passed. And when he arrives, he arrives via train and he spends two hours in um, Champaign-Urbana, most of which is, is time spent on campus. Um, there are a thousand people who meet him um, at the train station. Um, and the newspaper reports uh, describe individuals covering all the roofs of the buildings downtown to see the president um, arrive. Um, and he's met by a small parade of automobiles that, that are led by a University of Illinois professor. Um, and then this is this is the the um, uh, car that he is he is being driven around um, the community with. And when he arrives um, he, immediately from the train station, he's kind of taken to um, campus and specifically he's taken to Illinois Field, which um, is no longer really kind of a, a space on campus. This is now, um, you know, uh, uh, engineering and computer space on the north side of Green Street, although you can see here the old gymnasium, which which remains. Um, but this is the original um, athletic facility, the original athletic field on campus. It is now now the Beckman Institute um, covers most of this um, space on campus. And what Taft is doing is, as you can see here, is he's reviewing the university cadets, um, which were one of the one of uh, President Edmund James, who's depicted um, um, behind, he's the gentleman behind Taft with the top hat next to the officer with the sword. Um, and Edmund James is very, very proud of the off, the cadet corps at the University of Illinois, which which he um, says is one of the largest um, student cadet corps in the United States. He he write, he writes these kind of glowing letters to the Secretary of War before World War One, talking about how great the cadet corps is. Um, and so you, so you see this this is an this is an incredible moment for these university students that the commander in chief is is reviewing you as a soldier um and so what this means and as you know he 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 does this review there's there's a big brass band um you know it's this this kind of you know very um um formal moment he then returns to his automobile and is driven around campus and shown kind of the changes that have happened this is no longer the university that woodrow wilson said no to um, in 1892. This is now a modern cutting edge institution um, with a significant physical footprint. Um, and the cadet corps along his drive um, across campus, there are cadets on both sides of the street, 20 feet apart, lining the entire route. Um, so both is kind of the, the, the solemnity, the formality of the, um, you know, the the opportunity and and when he's driving you know through campus there's actually an interesting episode that is recounted in the paper that he wants to see lincoln hall which is under construction at the time um and and still um you know kind of one of the prominent uh, classroom buildings on campus and he stops the car he really kind of wants to see you know what is going up and one of the workers leans out a window and shouts hello bill 
Um, and the president responds, um, hello there. And then they kind of, the, all of the workmen who are working on the building kind of give this, 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 this cheer, this, this very loud, um, applause for the president and kind of doff their hats to him as he drives off, um, and continues to go across, um, the campus. And then he eventually makes his way back to the train station where he gives a short address. Um, and this is an interesting again kind of an episode thinking about the university within larger geopolitical places and larger national places is he uses his address in champaign urbana to defend the ongoing debates about the u.s canadian reciprocity treaty um he specifically says at the beginning of his speech he only came to champaign urbana to see the university that he was only there to review the troops he had heard he had heard such great things about the campus um but he uses the opportunity in in the example of champaign urbana and i've reproduced here a portion of the speech that he gives from the platform of his train car where he specifically says the connection between champaign and urbana reflects the relationship between the united states and canada that um, someday these places, someday will come about um, that these, you know, he doesn't understand why Champaign and Urbana aren't one town, um, but that someday it'll happen. And that that is reflective of the relationship between the United States and Canada, that the, the efforts that he is currently going to negotiate this treaty reflect the relationship and the trajectory of the town. And so there's a, there, there's a not too subtle political message that he is trying to articulate by visiting this particular set of communities at this particular um, time. And after he gives this speech, President Edmund James then joins um, the presidential party and actually uh, then travels aboard um, their train to Decatur, where Taft has another um, speech shortly following. Um, and so again, you see a rising of the profile of the institution. Um, and the area becomes important then the following year when Theodore Roosevelt um, arrives in the community. And Theodore Roosevelt comes um, amidst an interesting kind of dynamic in presidential politics. That 1912 is an election with, with many, many candidates. Um, and many candidates both from major parties and, and small parties. And what um, is happening is, is William Howard Taft is up for, for re-election, um, running on uh, kind of, uh, you know, a tried and true, like, look, my administration has been fine, stay the course, continue. Um, Woodrow Wilson is running for the Democratic Party, and then Theodore Roosevelt is running on the Bull Moose platform. He's running um, on his own party platform, um, largely in disgust with what William Howard Taft has done. And he is attempting to peel off the more progressive um, and liberal wing of the Republican Party and pull them into his ranks. Um, and then kind of also happening in the same election, um, Eugene Debs is running, is, is kind of the perpetual uh, candidate for the Socialist Party. Um, and so when Theodore Roosevelt arrives in, in April of 1912, actually April 7th, 1912, so, so this week, um, over a century ago, um, there's an estimated 3,000 people um, in attendance to see the former president um, speak. And although he does not physically speak on campus, this is a photograph from Westside Park in Champaign where he does address um, the crowd for over 40 minutes. Um, he is driven around town by um, F.K. Robeson, who uh, the, the founder of the Robeson department store, which is again, still in downtown Champaign to this day. Um, so he does actually go see campus. He's driven around um, by kind of this local notable and, and sees the sites, sees kind of, kind of the community. Um, and in this 40 minute address here, he is um, articulating his progressive message why he sees himself the failures of the republican party the failures of the democratic party and why his path is the best way forward and so what he does is he's calling for increased government regulations he's calling um for a check on the power of the corporations you know this is a man who when he was um president had passed the pure food and drug act um you know partially in response to the outcry of upton sinclair's jungle and the conditions of the chicago stockyards um He's also calling for workmen's compensation, and specifically in this speech, he's also calling for an end um, to child labor and the passage of a child labor law, um, and and gives this you know this powerful address that that you know they say that there are three thousand, others say that there's eighteen thousand people who are there at this address, um, you know, but is is able to again kind of use his celebrity, his position as a very popular ex president and a, and a youthful ex president right to to bring folks from from um all across the county to to hear him um 
speak and then and then he um, boards his train and and moves on. Um, but you can see again that the possibilities with with particularly with rail travel and Champaign Urbana's um, place on the New Orleans to Chicago rail line as well as the big four east west line um, that we're having a lot of these figures come to campus that this is a good place to stop there's there's a significant population they're politically active and you have a robust university um, of, of folks who are interested in politics and and are you know willing to vote um, you know on the issues um, the next figure is again when i said i had a capacious definition you know of the figures that i wanted to talk about today is eleanor roosevelt who among all the people that I've talked about today um, and will talk about today, besides, short of Abraham Lincoln um, and, and both Adelaide Stevensons, who, again, because of their um, life in Bloomington, spend a significant amount of time and also long time involvement in Illinois politics, um, visits campus the most. Um, and she comes both as the first lady representing the Roosevelt administration and, and discussions of a variety of different policy platforms, but she also comes later in her career when she is, um, you know, a, one of the leading diplomats and kind of one of these global figures, um, you know, articulating and supporting the United Nations um, and kind of seeking um, collaboration and peace worldwide. And then she finally also comes in 1960, both as this kind of elder figure within, you know, the United Nations and kind of the international um, diplomatic corps, as well as a um, ardent kind of elder figure within the Democratic Party, as, as we're going to talk about. Um, and in her first visit in 1937, you know, she's coming it later in the Depression. Um, she's coming after her um, husband's reelection in 1936, um, and she's speaking at the um, um, at a Hillel forum on youth in a world of turmoil. So, you know, this is 1937. There are there are signs of trouble in Europe um, that there are um, warning signs, both the rise of Hitler and Nazi Germany, the rise of fascist Italy um, and that the continued struggles of the Great Depression are affecting wide swaths of the community. And so she is articulating this vision of the possibility for you that you are these important figures that we have these great problems. And that you as university students, you as youth, are the ones who are going to be solving these issues. And that many of the issues that we are grappling with in this time period are continuations of World War I. Um, and that there are all sorts of possibilities, um, you know, to bring about these changes, to, to, you know, really, again, make a better world. And so it's, it's a very important address when you, when you think about what she's articulating and in the time period that she is articulating this um, at an address at Hillel on campus. And she returns five years later, which is this image of her, I believe, in, in um, Huff Jim, um, someone who has a better understanding of, of the interior of, of campus buildings in the 1940s might be able to correct me on this one. Um, but she, she comes in 1942 amidst World War II. Um, and she's speaking at, at Farm and Home Week, um, and she's speaking specifically on the need for food and agriculture and conservation and food conservation for the war effort. That the U and this is again an important kind of link between the university's mission as a land grant college, which which with a very influential and large ag program, um, that she is um, speaking again for the need for. Um, contributions for the war effort, that there are um, ways that that food and agriculture could be critical. Um, she's also interviewed on the role of women in the war effort and specifically says that women should remain in college, um, that that women, college educated women are going to be more important for the war effort than to leave and go get factory work or do other things, that the future of the world, the redeveloped world, when when Europe and other places are being rebuilt after the war, we're going to need a, a workforce and an educated group of people who can bring about this change, re, bring about this rebuilding. She also makes a visit, and this is an interesting kind of aside on this visit, she also makes a visit to the Illini Union, which had just been completed in 1941 as a public works um, project under the Great Depression, and she actually cuts an anniversary cake. Um, and so if, if you're on campus today or the next time you're on campus, um, I highly recommend, you know, if you're in the Illini Union and you go through the front entryway, there's a large wooden plaque um, denoting the fact that it is a uh, PWA project um, from the Great Depression and, and is denoted that Franklin Delano Roosevelt was president at the time, but his wife is the one then who kind of has this one year anniversary dedication ceremony um, when she visits in 1942. And she returns then, um, you know, over a decade later, but in a different position. She is no longer the first lady. 
Um, but she is now, um, you know, the, the U.S. delegate, uh, the U.S. ambassador, well, the former at this point, the former U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. She is, you know, this critical figure in the drafting of the UN Declaration of Human Rights, the founding of the United Nations. And so she comes in 1954 for a little UN, for a model UN um, General Assembly. So you can imagine all of these students um, who are there representing their, their, you know, fictional depictions of their nations, you know, and, and working out um, their model UN. And here you have, you know, one of the founding figures of this institution, you know, this, this United States institution, um, speaking on tensions in the world today. Specifically, she speaks on ongoing tensions in, in Kashmir between India and Pakistan um, in this time period, as well as French incursions and French colonialism in North Africa. Um, and so she's kind of offering her um, assessment of ongoing um, geopolitical concerns in this forum. Um, and is also meeting with students, meeting with with other figures in the community, um, and really makes an impression on the student body. Um, and again, is again seen by her ability to comment on world events, her kind of position within um, wider diplomatic circles. And then she comes again in two years later for um, another uh, Hillel sponsored lecture, and this time it's it's held. Um, at Follinger Auditorium, where she speaks on concepts of world communism um, in 1956. And she is also interviewed on I, uh, WILL um, for this visit in 1956. And after um, her speech, she attends the inaugural event of the International uh, Students Association on campus. They have, uh, at the time, they have International Coffee House um, that they're holding at the Illini Union in the Commons area. So you can imagine you're a registered student organization at the University of Illinois. It is your first event. You are supporting international students at this institution in the middle of the Cold War. You're having your very first event, and your guest is Eleanor Roosevelt former UN, United States ambassador um, to the United Nations and first lady like that. That's a pretty good get like students are going to want to come to your event um, if, you know, um, if if Eleanor Roosevelt is the one who um, is going to be, you know, um, um, visiting. And so, you know, it's, it, it shows that she's not just giving these speeches, but she's actually really interested in kind of the conditions of international students and, and interested in um, you know, what is, what is going on, but again, particularly with, with, with the international students. And she makes one final visit then in 1960. Um, she comes, and again, this is, this is, is her time as one of the elder statesmen, stateswomen of the Democratic Party and kind of wider global politics. And she's coming amidst the election of Jack Kennedy. Um, Actually, when she's when she's in the Champaign Urbana area, uh, Richard Nixon's also doing a whistle stop tour, um, and so you see this this photo of him. Actually, he's down at Tuscola, um, just south of town, um, on his whistle stop tour. But Eleanor Roosevelt is giving a speech at the YMCA on campus, um, and so th there's kind of a, a theme you're going to see that the YMCA becomes this kind of space where a lot of these figures figures are speaking. Um, and she's she's actually asked a, a number of interesting questions um, about kind of ongoing geopolitical issues and also the position of the um, Kennedy administration, because the context for this visit is it's very sh it's, it's only a matter of weeks after um, uh, the, the Soviet premier Nikola, uh, Nikita Khrushchev has, has banged his shoe um on the the dais at the united nations and kind of had had these grand theatrical kind of exchanges and so she's asked about this and instead of me um explaining to you what's going on um i am going to have um eleanor explain it to you hold on oh Oop. excuse me so hopefully the audio is a little wonky on this but we're going to have eleanor explain do you think the communists wish to or plan to wreck the United Nations? Well, I think Mr. Khrushchev had every intention, if he couldn't get his own way, to wreck the United Nations, if he could, because he's not accustomed to not getting his own way. And even though we also were put out of the Congo, um, he didn't like being put out of the Congo at all. And particularly, he was opposed to the Secretary General, who he insisted was a tool of the imperialist U.S. And um, so I think he did. But of course, he'd come to rule the African nations 
and uh, the vote showed that he was not successful. And so he could not succeed in wrecking the United Nations, and I think he left it stronger than ever before, and in this country had a marvelous effect. Because I find wherever I go, I don't have to explain anymore about the United Nations. Suddenly there's a tremendous interest and everybody knows about it. So it did us a great deal of good, and I think it did the UN a great deal of good. And so you can see with with you know this 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 short little clip from her Q and A session at the YMCA on campus, which is also then photographed here, um, you know, at top of the Daily Illini. Um, she's commenting on you know Nikita Khrushchev's kind of theatrics at um, the the United Nations, um, Soviet policy, and United States policy in in Africa, um, as well as just wider recognition of the United Nations. That you know she's been doing these these lectures that we saw in um, the 50s, you know, traveling, kind of speaking on behalf of the United Nations, benefiting, you know, the benefit that it provides for um, the United States on the world stage and its importance. And, and as she says, she, she doesn't have to do that anymore. Everybody knows the UN now because we, we, we have seen what's going on. Um, but she's also speaking as a representative, you know, of the Kennedy campaign. She's also um, speaking on behalf of the party. And so she, she's asked about um, you know, Jack Kennedy, and she says in, in her address here that we need someone like Nikita Khrushchev, someone with, with the, the, you know, the charisma, the drama, um, and the ability to convey democracy as emotionally and as forcefully as Nikita Khrushchev does on the world stage. You know, we're in this Cold War, we need um, our own advocate, and she says that Jack Kennedy is that person, that Richard Nixon is not the figure um who is going to be able to go toe to toe with you know this loud boisterous kind of figure um even though he actually has personally gone toe to toe with Nikita Khrushchev during the 1959 uh, kitchen debates in Moscow um and Richard Nixon himself also you know both as as the vice president for um Dwight D Eisenhower and then his his own presidential candidacy in 1960 um is attending um and visiting the University of Illinois and so his, he makes his first visit in 1954 where he also speaks at the YMCA um, and he speaks on the back of a truck actually you can kind of see a, a very very small um kind of in the corner of this photograph um where he is giving an address um you know to approximately 5,000 students at the YMCA um this is the midterm elections he is he and um Dwight D. Eisenhower are first selected in 1952 um this is amid the the um midterm elections of, of 1954 um and again speaking um you know about the importance of Republican leadership um continued Republican leadership you know during the Cold War um and the need for um you know a return of of Republican congressmen and Republican senators um to uh Congress this this year um he is going to again Again, as as the Eleanor Roosevelt, you know, kind of foreshadowed, um, he's going to return in the 1960s, um, in 1960 specifically when he is running um, for president and doing a whistle stop tour through the area. But it's actually his opponent, um, John Jack Kennedy, who makes the most um, um, extended um, visit to the university for this election. Um, and, and Jack Kennedy actually spends a significant amount of time um, at the University of Illinois um, during his, um, during his uh, candidacy. And it's actually Kennedy's second visit to the university. Um, he was the commencement speaker for the winter commencement in 1957. Um, when he was just, he was just a senator kind of rising in popularity, you know, he, he was a war hero. Um, and and was kind of again seen as kind of this like new wave of of young, a youth in in the halls of um, the Capitol, but again um, was was just the commencement speaker at the winter winter commencement in January of 1957. Um, but in 1960, he flew into Champaign. He flew into Willard um, on their private campaign plane um, and was paraded through town in an open top convertible, as as you can see here. Um, and again, is photographed outside the YMCA um, of all places. And so you can see the draw and the interest of the students in the candidate. Um, that, you know, the, the streets are lined with, with interested students, um, that they are kind of drawn. Again, he is promoting his 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 image of a new frontier, this, this very forward thinking, um, you know, kind of uh, 
reliance on experts and youth and um, new possibilities for the 1960s. That this is going to be a new decade, um, and that we have to have new ways of of thinking. And he addresses the students then on the quad. And so from the steps of Follinger Auditorium, and so you can see thousands of students filling the quad to hear um, candidate um, Senator Kennedy um, speak before them on um, a whole wide range of issues. And there are some just, in, in, you know, incredible photographs um, of this day. And you can, again, see the interest in the, the presidency and, and this particular election from the student body. You can also see, again, a specific effort to court the youth vote. This is not like Theodore Roosevelt, who is lecturing on in Westside Park over in Champaign, or, or a, you know, a lecture that is being given in, in a park in Urbana or a different public space. This is being done on campus. It's also being filmed, which I apologize for the quality of this YouTube. This is the only um, copy of this recording that I have ever been able to track down. But it is um, Jack Kennedy's address where he is going to articulate his criticisms of Eisenhower and by proxy Nixon's Cold War policy. Um, specifically, he's speaking on the lack of expertise within the U.S. diplomatic corps. Um, and, and he's using this campus in particular to articulate this vision because the University of Illinois at this time is already recognized as a leader in international education that it has a large international student body there's a reason why Eleanor Roosevelt is speaking at model UN meetings at the university um, just a few years prior and he's talking about the concerns of youth it's the direction of the Cold War it is their future what kind of world do they want? Do they want a world of diplomats who can speak the language and know the people? Or do they want, you know, um, um, folks who don't know what they're doing, um, you know, changing the direction? And he's also speaking to United States foreign policy with the global south, specifically Africa and Asia, and looking at the inroads that the Soviet Union is making into those areas and what the United States isn't doing. And so I'll just play just a little bit of Jack Kennedy, um, you know, speaking on the steps of Follinger Auditorium. <laughs> But if this is the way we turn out in these strong Republican senators, what's happening to Mr. Nixon all over the United States? This is an important campaign. And these are important issues which face our country. And I appreciate your coming here. Prince Bismarck once said that one third of the students, I guess you better maybe get down there a little bit. The only time in this campaign the photographers did anything we asked them to do. <laughs> Prince Bismarck once said that one third of the students of German universities broke down from overwork, another third broke down from dissipation, and the other third ruled Germany. I do not know which third of the student body of this university is here today, but I'm confident I'm talking to the rulers of America in the sense in the sense that all educated men and women have the obligation to accept the discipline of self-government. Mr. Nixon and I campaigned for the most important office in the free world. But in my judgment, this is more than a contest between Mr. Nixon and myself. It is more than a contest between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party. It is a contest between the contented and the concerned between those who wish to stand still and those, and those who wish to move ahead. And so I will, I will um, make the rest of the speech available through the museum for those who, who want to watch the rest of it. Um, but then you can see him leaving campus here where he's, he's passing um, the, the armory. And you can see, again, the student interest. They're, they're chasing down his motorcade. Um, and it's also, again, just reflective of a different era. The, the safety issue, um, you know, that you would never be able to get this close to uh, the president or a presidential candidate um, in, in this, this day and age. But, but the students are, are very excited. Um, to see Jack Kennedy, and you can see the the very concerned policeman um, trying to just you know make sure things things are things are going well. Um, and after you know um, also in the 1960s, and this is this is again um, a, a very uh, kind of capacious definition of what it means when when you have a presidential candidate visit is much more recent. Um, and that is um, to to think about the relationship to kind of uh, uh, current politics. You know, uh, President 
Joe Biden did visit campus in 2015 to unveil the Obama administration's um, uh, campus sexual violence program. Um, but his running mate and, and now Vice President Kamala Harris actually grew up and spent part of her childhood in um, Champaign-Urbana and, and tied to the University of Illinois campus um, because her father, uh, Donald Harris, um, a, f a fresh graduate from the economics department at Berkeley, um, his first job out of graduate school was a one year uh, uh, postdoc position at the University of Illinois. Um, and he served just on the faculty for a very, very short time um, from from 67 to or 66 to 67. And, and he actually is on campus even before that. He gives a lecture on campus in, in 1965. And so he's the, the, the Harris's are here, you know, at a very contentious time um, in in U.S. history. And, and that is reflected um, in the kind of work that um, Donald Harris is doing and the issues that he is speaking about on campus um, and, and goes back to the issues that Kennedy is speaking in his lecture, um, that it's these questions of development, it's these questions of United States relationship with the global south, and it is also, you know, growing tensions with Vietnam and, and the Vietnam War, um, as you can see in this lecture, in this conversation that, that he is part of um, in um, November of, of 1966. And so, you know, the current vice president, um, although she was she is not born in Champaign, her younger sister Maya was born in, in Champaign-Urbana. Um, and so there is this relationship, again, um, it, Kamala Harris, as, as far as I know, has, has not returned to um, um, Champaign um, in recent memory, but, but does have this relationship. Um, and does have this connection and is of, of the folks we're talking about, you know, the, the Stevensons have their Bloomington connections. Um, this is the most direct connection um, until we get to the 1980s um, um, to, to the university. Now, another interesting episode, and as we kind of close and get to the more recent issues, and this is the one, these are the visits that, that, that those in attendance might actually remember. And those are the visits um, in, in the 1990s. Um, and so what I, what I have actually, and, and I'm sharing here is, is um, the material from Hillary Clinton's 1994 commencement address. Um, she visited this in 1992, um, when she is campaigning for, for her husband, um, during his first presidential campaign. Um, she also, as she notes, actually in her speech, has been to Champaign-Urbana at least once before. She Again, she's born in Chicago um, and as a child attended a football game at Memorial Stadium. She doesn't say uh, who who the um, Illini were, were competing against, but um, when she visited, they won. And then when she was on campus in 92, uh, the football team also won. Um, she actually gives two commencement addresses this year. The university in 1994 did both a commencement ceremony in Memorial Stadium and Assembly Hall. So she gives actually two speeches um, and is, is given an honorary doctorate. Um, but for those who you know remember their time on campus or the Champaign community, um, th the notes for her speech, um, courtesy of the um, William J. Clinton Presidential Library, um, here kind of show the interesting, this, this is the earliest outline of her address. And so you can see the things, they've, they've done their research. Um, and she actually reaches out and she talks about it in the speech. Um, and, and, and Bill Clinton will make kind of a similar comment in 1998 that they actually know quite a few people who either had children um, graduating at the university. Hillary makes specific mention of, of she knows children of friends who are graduating at that very ceremony. Um, and that there are people in Washington that they know who have a relationship um, to the university are either alumni or have children. And so somehow when they're, when they're outlining this, this address, the, the, the first thing on the list is Papa Del's Pizza and then Garcia's Pizza and then Cam's, although it is, it is spelled differently. differently. Um, and then also the chief issue, and this is part of the conversation. There is correspondence. This is amid, this is amid the debate over um, the mascot at the university, and, and there are there is correspondence with the university about what is going on and, and how to to handle this. Um, and then also they list the coffee shops, specifically um, Espresso Royale. Um, so they're 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 very interested in kind of the culinary opportunities, um, and then and, and then because Cam's also on there on the the uh, drinking establishments, and in one of the early drafts of her commencement address she actually compares um she compares democratic debates and then and polarization to um whether you prefer papa dell's or garcia's pizza um this did not actually make it into the final address what the actual commencement address mostly becomes is a reflection on her visit the week prior to the inauguration of nelson mandela 
Um, and so she uses this opportunity to talk about the possibilities for democracy, the challenge of democracy, uh, particularly the challenges of a multicultural democracy. Um, and really, it is a powerful address, kind of talking on her thoughts of, of witnessing that um, the, the possibility that his release from prison um, and, and his um, forgiveness, she specifically talks about how he invited his former jailers um, to attend his inauguration. Um, and again, just the power of democracy ultimately becomes the core of, of this speech in 1994. And I know those who were, who were there certainly will, will remember um, um, this. And then she also uses her speech to kind of talk about the need for health care um, and the need for health insurance um, and low income health insurance and the need for improved access and the high cost of health care um, in the United States. So you can see, you know, one of her uh, uh, important issues as a first lady um, is, is prominent in this um, address as well. And her husband then returns four years later, um, along with the vice president. And this is the only time in the history of the university that both the president and vice president, acting president and vice president, have been at the university at the same time. And now those of you who remember this event or know this event, the, the, the thing that everybody remembers um, is that when Air Force One tried to take off, it got stuck in the mud on the runway. Um, and they had to, um, Clinton actually had to leave on Air Force Two on the backup plane uh, that they always bring with them. Um, um, that kind of becomes the, the part that, that people remember, but the context for this address um, is it is the day after his 1998 State of the Union. And so this is kind of, again, typical with the State of the Union is after the address, you go somewhere to kind of bring home the points of the speech. And so he uses the speech to reiterate um, all of the major points of of his address, where he is he is um, kind of emphasizing um, the the emergence of the 21st century that we need to be prepared, um, you know, for this this new era that is going to be reliant on um, technology that we need expanded education, social security reform, um, and science and medicine funding. Um, and he is introduced by Vice President Al Gore, who spends a significant amount of time um, in his address talking about the University of Illinois as a hub for technological and engineering innovation. Um, he talks about his frequent visits to the campus as a senator um, and, and also as a congressman, talks about having friends um, who have attended the university, friends on faculty, um, and, and really talks about the importance of the university in the development of the internet. Um, he specifically uh, mentions the creation of the first transistor um, and the development of Mosaic. Um, and, and the efforts by the university and its engineering and computer um, 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 faculty and students to develop the, as, as he refers to it at the time, the information superhighway. Um, and that really this is a university that is going to bring us into the 21st century. Um, and, and Clinton kind of um, building on that also um, expands on kind of the importance of the internet, the importance of these issues. Um, and and also the importance of uh, um, educational or environmental policy, uh, both Clinton and Gore speak about global warming and the need to, um, you know, enact um, environmental policy and in the entire address the university has digitized the entire um, visit. Um, it's, it's an hour long we're only gonna I'm only going to um, show you just the kind of the opening portions of of Clinton's speech at Assembly Hall. Um, where he is you know, welcomed by the student body. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Well, thank you, thank you. I was uh, just sitting here thinking two things. First, when the vice president got really warmed up. <laughs> uh, I thought to myself first, it will become slightly obvious to this audience that he and I come from a little further south in the United States. <laughs> and then, uh, then I was thinking when he really got going, I, I wish I had people walking the aisles passing the plate. You know, it was amazing. <laughs> I thought we uh, have an invitation or something. <laughs> anyway, 
The second thing I thought in the midst of this wonderful event was that I, I wished I could take the pep band with me for the next month or two. Uh, thank you. The other thing to know about, you know, the, 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 this, um, obviously the crowd is, is responding very, very positively, very, very excited. Um, and, and Clinton's comments on, on the, the emotion of Gore's opening address, Gore, it, it points a shouting um, about the, the things that the um, Clinton administration has done um, and the need to enact, you know, new policies. And, and this is a particularly stressful time in, in the second um, um, term of, of President Clinton, because this is, this is a week after the um, sex scandal involving Monica Lewinsky is, is publicly revealed. Um, and this is two days after he publicly denies having sexual relations with Monica Lewinsky. Um, and it also then follows on the, um, again, the, the State of the Union in 1998, the day, the day after. And so this is this, this tipping point in the, in the controversy that will ens in, you know, ensnare um, a large portion of the remainder of his term in office. And so you can see you know, that this is a particularly tense time. The, their political careers are on the line. The, the successes of the administration are, are on the line. Um, and the scandal that will only grow with time. Um, is just beginning. And that is very much evident in, in kind of Gore's portion of the speech. Um, whereas whereas uh, President Clinton himself, it, it kind of just gives a standard stump speech and, and it kind of continues um, in talking about, talking about um, his, his uh, campaign promises. And so, you know, just kind of in closing, there are more visits by more figures and it, it, it will take a lot more time. And I thank you for for the time you have you have um, taken with me today of others who have visited this campus. William Jennings Bryan makes frequent visits um, as a, both um, you know, for political reasons and also as a Chautauqua speaker. Um, Truman and Eisenhower both make whistle stops um, in the community during their, their um, presidential campaigns. And Adelaide Stevenson, who um, is, runs against Eisenhower, um, both um, visits the area quite significantly, both as the governor of Illinois, but also as as just a local figure from Bloomington. He he is not unfamiliar to to Champaign Urbana. Um, Jimmy Carter and Gerald Ford both make visits in 1976, and in 1980, John Anderson, the liberal Republican who has his independent um, campaign, he's the only University of Illinois alum on this list, um, graduating the class of, of 1942, and visits campus um, during his campaign. Actually, closes his campaign. Um, in, in Champaign in 1980. Um, Ronald Reagan and H.W. And, uh, Bush also visit in 1980. And then more recently, Joe Biden um, and, and Bernie Sanders both made visits, one in the capacity of, of the vice president um, and the other as um, uh, the candidate for the presidency in 2016. Um, and then Barack Obama um, is, is the most recent um, visiting in, in 2018. Very importantly, it's kind of a return to public life. It was, it was a very public address. Um, you know, in, in the, the beginnings of um, the most recent presidential campaign and airing his kind of criticisms of uh, then um, contemporary administration policies and seen as a particular moment where he was stepping back into the limelight um, and, and making very pointed critiques um, as, as part of that, that ongoing election, but, but is the most recent visit. Um, and, and the Barack Obama visit was, you know, students really enjoyed because not only did he speak in Follinger Auditorium, um, but then he stopped at... Um, um, uh, uh, he stopped at, at Cafe Paradiso um, with the governor um, and, and kind of chatted with students. So again, kind of this, this um, you know, local politics kind of thing, rubbing elbows with, with students was, was really enjoyed by, by, I think, a lot of folks on campus. Um, and with that, um, that's, that's our conversation today. I want to thank, you know, the, the individuals listed here who provided images and, and materials um, for this. And if anyone um, has questions, I know there's a couple already, you know, I will, I will happily answer anything you might, you might have. And because this is a webinar, um, attendees, if you'd like to ask your question out loud, just use the raise your hand function and I will unmute you and you can um, speak out loud. Well, maybe let's start with um, the questions from Ryan Ross about um, Woodrow Wilson and then some later, later yeah, folks. So so I want to thank Ryan for both of these very, very, very specific, very, you know, someone who knows more about the university um, than just about anybody around. Um, so Ryan's first question was about the relationship between Woodrow Wilson and Edmund James um, during World War One um, and, and specifically James and then uh, Vice President Kinney. Um, 
um, really um, mobilize the university for the war effort. So, you know, James and Wilson are contemporaries. They're both um, political scientists um, and um, do have uh, some correspondence, do spend time together um, at different things and, and have, a, have a very good relationship. But, but Edmund James is a very public critic um, of Woodrow Wilson early in his administration when Woodrow Wilson is um, positioning himself on a neutrality platform of staying out of the war in Europe um, that began in 1914 and says that um, the university and that the United States needs to be prepared. And so Edmund James becomes a very strong proponent of um, preparedness programs um, that, that kind of spring up throughout the United States prior to the United States entrance into the war. Um, and this is partially, you know, he is very interested in the Cadet Corps and having a student body that is prepared and trained for whatever um, could happen. And that the best thing the United States could do um, before the war um, would be to be prepared, that that we don't want to be caught, um, you know, on our heels. And so he organizes a preparedness parade. Um, he, you know, expands the, the cadet corps. And it's interesting that James is doing that because James's PhD is, is from Germany. His wife is Prussian um, and, and is kind of seen as a uh, Germanophile by many on the faculty. Um, and so becomes, again, a, a very loud advocate for um, preparing for a future war in Germany. And when war ultimately does break out, um, it puts the university completely at the disposal of um, the United States and actually uh, sends a telegram immediately to Woodrow Wilson saying, whatever you need, I am personally at service. Um, and that that if you need anything for the war effort, both as an institutional level and as a personal level, I will do what I can. And he actually writes out the entire text of his telegram to Woodrow Wilson after the declaration of war in his diary, which is which is at the University of Illinois archive, if anybody wants to um, kind of peek at it. Um, you know, as an aside, Edmund James is also friends with Theodore Roosevelt um, and does spend some time with, with Theodore Roosevelt, actually visits him a couple times in New York, and that's also documented in Edmund James's diaries. Um, and then Ryan's second question was about the Claybaugh Act um, and, and about the specific context of why these political speeches are at the YMCA. So um, after World War II, um, there, was a, there was a law passed in Illinois called the Claybaugh Act, um, which specifically restricted um, political speeches um, on um, university campuses that you you were unable anyone who criticized or advocated the overthrow of the United States government couldn't use um, uh, state resources um, so you couldn't like rent a room um, to um, you know like the Communist Party or or let them speak on campus and this kind of ultimately encompassed a lot of political speech. It was specifically targeting when the Illinois legislature passed it. It was actually targeting um, uh, Northwestern and um, Roosevelt um, University in, in Chicago, um, which kind of had more robust um, kind of political landscapes than Illinois, whereas the University of Illinois was seen as, as the relatively conservative um, and more traditional university on campus. Um, and so uh, political speakers didn't speak on campus. Instead, they spoke at the Y. Um, and, and this is why the why then and now, um, you know, is very much a hub for a lot of, um, you know, student activism and student politics, um, because it is, you know, it's close to campus, but it is not technically campus property proper. Um, and so you're able to host other types of speakers. And the Claybaugh Act ultimately is broken um, by the University of Illinois. Um, in the 1960s, there's an effort to organize a branch of the um, W.E.B. Du Bois Club, which is a um, college organization um, run by the Communist Party, um, and they ultimately sue um, the university, and then the, the attorney for the Communist Party comes down from Chicago and gives a, a big speech in front of the Illini Union on the quad facing Follinger Auditorium. Um, and and just it, it gives an address critiquing U.S. policy in Vietnam. Doesn't talk about overthrowing the federal government or or, or revolution or anything like that. Um, and at that moment, the the the, the Claybaugh Act kind of just just falls apart. That they they can't enforce it anymore. It's it's already unconstitutional to begin with. Um, and and that kind of changes the political dynamics of of that. You get a perfect grade from Ryan for your Oh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, let me jump in with a question. Um, 
for those who haven't gotten to see Nathan's exhibit, which uh, you can visit anytime if you're in town because the museum is reopened to the public, um, we, we tried really hard to use um, what is a kind of strange collection of mostly US presidential campaign memorabilia to talk about individual people's potential for personal connection and personal involvement and personal statement kind of within political systems. And I'm wondering, um, thinking about that, what you have discerned from what you've researched about what presidential and candidate visits mean to student audiences mm -hmm. or even to local, just local audiences in general. Well, they kind of put your community on the map because um, they you get international and, and national press attention kind of depending on what the issue is. Um, this is most readily visible by, by uh, uh, former President Obama's visit in 2018, where as this moment where he was kind of stepping out, you know, it got international coverage because of his, his sharp criticisms of, of the Trump administration um, in this address. But it means, you know, for students, it, it's the high point of of their um you know student career it's an opportunity where you you get to feel like you actually can change the world like the president's there to talk to you mm -hmm. um and this is most readily reflected you know when i was putting this together um and and if if those of you in attendance aren't familiar with the 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 local newspaper the news gazette has been running um a long kind of series as part of the 150th anniversary of the university which is now now well past um but they have interviewed a lot of alumni um, and they're kind of continuing the series, interviewing, you know, alumni from all walks of life. And I was pleasantly surprised with the amount of 90s alumni who, you know, and, and Beth included, who <laughs> remember when Clinton was on campus, either Hillary or Bill. Um, and that that was like a high point. You know, if you were if you were a member of the class of 1994, you got to see Hillary Clinton twice. Um, if you um, were a freshman in 1994, you saw, you know, Hillary was the commencement speaker that year. And then, you know, at the end of your time, Bill Clinton was on, on, on campus. And, and many of these events also coincide with, with other things that are going on on campus. Um, and, you know, I didn't include it because it was, you know, kind of an aside, but, but like when uh, Eleanor Roosevelt's second visit coincides with, with Count Basie performing um, in the auditorium on campus. And there's also um, another former um, senator giving a talk on campus. So, you know, you, you kind of understand that a, that a campus like the University of Illinois, um, you know, attracts these notable people. And it, it's, it's important for the students. Again, you feel connected. You feel like you're part of something. And this is why many of these candidates are using these addresses to particularly talk about the importance of youth. Um, on politics, this is why Eleanor Roosevelt is talking about youth in turmoil in 1937. This is why Jack Kennedy is talking about the need for an educated diplomatic corps in 1960. And it's why Al Gore is talking in 1998 about the importance of the internet um, and, and the students who understand how the internet works um, or the information superhighway as he calls it in the speech. I highly recommend watching the beginning of the portion because because he really does start shouting about the internet um in his address but <laughs> i think that i think that that's why you remember it um mm -hmm. when i was a student i stood in the rain to watch barack obama um um in in 2018 and he just popped out of the back of Follinger, waved at us and left um you know and it doesn't really matter what what the political party is you know um these people are coming you know that there are uh, you know students of all stripes who are going to these addresses it's not necessarily supporters Although is, you know, the image right here with the people chasing down JFK presumably are, are, are you know, um, supporting him. So it's, 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 yeah, it's a notable event. Yeah, they're powerful. They're powerful things. I was one of those 90s kids in my, uh, the, the first Clinton election was the first one I could vote in. Um, mm -hmm. I started college in the fall of 92. And so within a few weeks of, you know, coming to the big U and someone like Hillary Clinton being on campus just made me, it made me feel like an adult. It made me feel, like you said, connected to these big national things that now I could participate in, participate in because I was 18. And it was just, um, it was really exciting. And I, you know, at that time was not remotely a political person at all, but it really, it really was meaningful to um, get a somewhat face-to-face -face experience, you know, like outside in back of the union with someone like that. Who is, a, who is also an articulate speaker, obviously. I'm sure a lot of these people are really good speakers, which must also be part of the effect. Well, and you can imagine, you know, it's, it's 1957. You know, you're, again, as, as I talked about, you're having coffee with Eleanor Roosevelt in the Illini Union. <laughs> you're an international student, right? And you get to talk to one of the founders of the United Nations 
over coffee in the Illini Union. Like, w w I, I would love to have been a fly on the wall of just like, because I'm sure she was very, very kind and like asking like, well, what are you studying? What's your major? You know, and here, here you have the ear of, you know, a figure like that. Um, you know, and this is, this is, this is beyond the University of Illinois a little bit, just to kind of continue this, this point is, is my current home institution, the University of Nebraska at Kearney. Um, it's claim to fame among presidential visits. It is the last place Bill Clinton visited as president. His, his last, you know, uh, visit in his capacity as president before um, the inauguration of um, George W. Bush was, was to give an address at the, here, here on campus. And part of the reason was, is um, Nebraska was the only state he hadn't visited yet as president yeah. in two terms of office. <laughs> that it took him until literally like the last weeks of his presidency to finally get here um and he came and it was i i was i i shook his hand um i was on a receiving line um with him and um you know it it is still a a, a very those who are on faculty at the time and, and the students in the community it's still they they remember oh yeah the day that bill clinton came to count and there are there are younger um or excuse me older members of the community who remember similarly jack kennedy also came here in in 1959 um, and so these things, you know, they become part of campus lore, um, they become notable events, um, and, and they become, you know, these important parts just of the wider history of, of you know, your campus, regardless of where you are um, or attending. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Feel free to put them in the Q&A. Um, while people maybe mull that over, I will share that Nathan's third and final talk as curator for this exhibit will be Thursday, July 8th, which seems kind of unfathomably far away at this point, <laughs> also at 4 p.m. And it's called A Petition in Boots, The Legacy of Jacob Cox's 1894 March on Washington, D.C., which was an idea that Nathan brought to us um, in the wake of um, January's um, attack on the Capitol. And I'm really excited to learn. This is an event I know absolutely nothing about. And I'm really, really interested to hear this story of one of the first, the first March on Washington, is it Nathan? Yeah, so that's gonna be fantastic, like a, a really long look at something that we, that is such an iconic event, repeatedly iconic events in our nation's history. Oh, it looks like questions have been answered. Um, this talk will be on YouTube and Facebook within a couple of weeks once I get a chance to clear up these slightly bonkers, automatically generated uh, captions. So if anyone would like to share this out, please do. Um, and hopefully we will see you in July for Nathan's next talk. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, Nathan. Thank you all.